Welcome to Composers in a Jukebox, a podcast that brings together a special breed of musicians in a conversation about their craft. We are thrilled to be in the company of Matt Dunkley today, an incredibly accomplished orchestrator, conductor, and composer. In this second part of our conversation, we explore Matt's work as a conductor, working with some of the world's leading composers, such as Hans Zimmer, as well as discovering some of Matt's original music. Okay, Welcome great back, to be Matt. back again. Matt. Hello, Matt. Welcome back. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, why don't we go right into it and start with your uh, relationship with Hans Zimmer? Um, why do you laugh every time he says Hans Zimmer? <laughs> he's, he's, he's not iconic, you know. <laughs> it's, it's should even, I, it's should even I pronounce it? Pronounce about. it? Pronounce it right? Oh, in, you're in German. German. It's pronounce Hans it. Zimmer. Yeah. Oh, um, there you go. So, yeah. Get the t- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the first thing. We learned today. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So what's your favorite Hans score you've you've worked on and and why? Um, I mean, yeah, I've been lucky. I mean, I'm, I I have to say I'm not his, I'm I'm his number two conductor, I guess, (laughs) which is, you know, it's still, it's still Hans Zimmer. Pretty good I'll take number two. Good place to be in. I I mean, Gavin Greenaway conducts most of his music and and I I know Gavin very well and he's a fantastic conductor and, you know, he's worked with Hans for many, many years. So I've got no beef with that. Um, But yeah, I've been lucky to to do a few. I I remember conducting uh, Inception, which was, was Mm. was a great score. Yeah, amazing score. And it was, it was the start of the the very loud uh, brass chord that has been much much copied but I, I i remember conducting that and we we recorded it all at air where hans likes to work yeah and um i mean hans and uh, chris nolan weren't weren't actually uh, at the studio which is very unusual but because it was the time do you remember that there was that um i think it was icelandic volcano and it like stopped all flights because there was so much stuff. Oh, stuff. I remember, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. I remember vaguely, yeah. So basically, yeah. so basically, Hans and, and Chris Nolan couldn't come to the sessions, which oh. they're always very hands on at the sessions. So we had them there in um, Santa Monica, you know, at Hans's studio in the middle of the night while we were recording. And uh, you know, Hans was in some sort of pajamas, <laughs> and, and Chris Nolan was still in, 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 in an impeccable three-piece suit and a tie, you know. And it was like you know, three a.m. in LA. So, uh, uh, but um, that was that was great. I mean, it's I think it's a really fantastic score. Um, Hans and and Lord Mouth had a lot lot of um, say in that score as well. And um, yeah, that 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 big brass chord thing that has been so copied was that that was to be there at the inception <laughs> oh, of, yeah. of that <laughs> of that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> was, was pretty cool. Um, so that, that I think that was a great score, and also I really enjoyed um, conducting uh, No Time to Die, the last Bond movie, which mm. was hands, yeah. hands wrote with Steve Mazzaro. Oh. And um, yeah, again, that's a, I think that's a really good score. And uh, um, yeah, to I mean you know, to conduct a Bond movie. So yeah, it's yeah, pretty cool, and and I got to co arrange the the title song, so t- yeah, t- t- ticking my arranger's box that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we actually have a question about that. Yeah. Um, going off of that, what what does arranging a song like that entail? What kind of workflow do you use? What kind of things did you do technically on that? Well, yeah, I mean, we got the you know we got the Billie Eilish track in, and and Hans um rang me up and i i don't normally arrange for hands i you know i've conducted for him but i don't normally arrange he's got a huge team of arrangers um and oscar Sennon does most of his stuff now but he knew that i'd been attached to the previous composer on on the bomb movie that that sadly it didn't work out and so i think you know he's a very loyal guy hands so he, he thought he'd uh, do, oh, nice. do, do the yeah. good thing and he, he invited me to uh, co-arrange the song with him so we had this Billie Eilish track which was you know it's a great song but it was very muted very sort of low-key sad in a way and it didn't feel at all bond like you know so my job with hands really was to convert it into the bond world uh, without killing this beautiful fragile song at the same time so, yeah you know there's a lot i mean we had a really big orchestra but i, mean, I remember you know hands is great so he's, i said i was like let's have some flutes there was a kind of in the first second verse i thought <laughs> so let's have some flutes and i said you know it would be great to have a couple of alto flutes and he says no let's have 12 you know so, so, <laughs> so you know we suddenly had this massive flute section <laughs> just doing these little kind of rocking alberti figures which was really cool 
And then we had like you know massive French horns. I think we had twelve French horns oh. and, and some and brass. But it was very you know it wasn't like a a, a, a super big sort of Tom Jonesy uh, John Barry sort of song because it's not that kind of song. Yeah. So it was really trying to get that those bond elements in you know. So I used like a kind of um, you know, plunger trumpet growling, play, playing like the theme in the background, you know, blah, 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 yeah, yeah. just very subtle and stuff. And then, you know, strings doing the sort of, doodly doodly doodly, you know, mm. r- runs down and things like that. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, a, it was an interesting one because it couldn't, you didn't feel it could get too big because it would swamp Billy's yeah, yeah. kind of fragile vocal. But in the end, I think we recorded, I remember, and Billy, Billy, Eilish, Billy Eilish and Phineas uh, O'Connor were both there at the sessions as well, and they were great. Um, and we recorded three versions. We recorded, I think, uh, I did one that was a kind of muted version, didn't go too big. Hans did one that was a sort of muted version, he didn't do too big. And then I did one, he said, just chuck everything at it. So yeah. I, did, I did a really big one. And Billy liked the big one. Yeah, <laughs> and she actually resung her master vocal. So if in the last chorus, she, you know, for Billie Eilish, she does a bell to make, Yeah, I think it only goes up to like a D or something. Yeah, but she's yeah. got quite a low voice, and she hits that that top note, and she resang all that just yeah. just oh. just to ride on top oh. of the orchestration. So um, that was really good fun. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, yeah. you really affected how that ended up sure. coming out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is very very cool. I mean, that's kind of a. You know, being part of Bond in that way is pretty yeah, cool. No, it was, yeah, no, that was really cool. Yeah. yeah, oh, amazing. Cool. Actually, speaking about, like, extremely large orchestral um, settings, how do you actually manage conducting, you know, so many people in one big room? Yeah, uh, versus smaller ensembles, yes. say. Yeah, well, uh, it's... I mean, it's it's the same process really, and you know, if you're in a studio environment, you, your they have a talkback mic, and your voice is in their headphones, so they can hear you, so you don't have to bellow and scream at them. Um, and it's just really, uh, especially with a big orchestra, if you're all in the room together, it's marshalling how you're going to do it, because normally what you'll do is you'll do a, a what you call a tutti take, you do a master take, where you have everybody playing, and then to give them some flexibility in in the dub in in the final mix, they might want to have the strings separate from the brass just because it just to give you that flexibility and um if you ca- i mean that is my preferred way of doing it i think if you everybody's in the room together because they all get the dna of each cue and they understand where they slot into it and you never have any intonation problems because they've already played it with the orchestra um the problem where you know quite often we'll do a day where you'll do you know a, a one or two string sessions and then a brass overdub session in the evening and the problem is they, as a brass, you know, I used to be a trumpet player, so I, I know as a brass player, if you're blowing out quite loudly, there's only so much information you can take in in your ears. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, however much you crank up the pre-recorded strings that you've done that day, they're never quite centred on it. And so you always have some intonation problems yeah. mm. just because they're not in the room with them. But if uh, there's something about the the kind of the alchemy of everybody in, being in the room together. And once they've played it, they, f- they find where their, yeah. their tonal centre is. Um, it might take a little bit longer that way around, but it is definitely my favourite way of doing it. And they, you know, the Americans call it striping. We, yeah, call, yeah. we, we call it stemming. But yeah, you, you do a tutti take and then you'll do a, a take mm-hmm. where you get the thing separate as well. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because then you're also putting them in their natural environment. They've yeah. spent okay. so many years playing like that. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. and, and and it just, you know, it gives context to the, to the cue. And also, you know, there's the brass players it gives them that they get a chance to rest as well. The problem when you do a brass overdub oh, session brutal. is you're just doing all the big stuff and you jump all the bars rest. And, you know, if there's a, if you're doing a stemming uh, version, then they, they have a rest while the strings are playing. So they get, you know, they'll get the cue off while yeah. to, to rest their lips. But if you're doing a brass overdub, then all they're doing is slamming all the way. And especially some of these big action scores. I mean, the, the writing is brutal, particularly for the French horns. Yeah. And so you have to be really careful with their lips because, yeah. you know, they're, it's just you can't keep playing. And I, I, you know, I, I literally have to, I have to get, but part of my job, I think, is to protect the players sometimes because, yeah. you know, and they're, they're fantastic players. They can play anything. And our horns are amazing, you know, the best in the world. But you do have to sometimes say to the booth, yeah, we've got one more like this. And then, yeah, you know, then we just need to do a few drop ins because yeah. it, it's killing them. And, mm-hmm. and if you want them to, yeah, play, so it's, it's interesting because we, We've recently had a conversation with Matthew Slater, uh, who, who works in charts, and we were talking about writing music for brass as well, and that was almost exactly what he said. Yeah. 
um, yeah, in, yeah. in terms of managing stamina and uh, and, and chops for brass instruments. It's um, yeah, so it is it is quite a universal thing and something that's worth thinking yeah. about. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it's. I think it's really important. It's it's it's, yeah. it's a respect as well to the musicians because, you know, they they mm -hmm. are they are such good players, and uh, uh, the, it's not that they they've got stamina issues. It's just you're asking them to do something that is that is beyond the the that you should ask them and it's getting to a point now where the brass players are beginning to complain about it and um i think there's an mu thing now where you you pay for a, a what you call a bumper where you have an extra yeah, play, yeah. extra yeah. player to to yeah. help the first yeah. help the first chairs share the share the load yeah which you know is is has been a regular thing in in the classical world if you ever go and watch a Mahler symphony there'll always be a there'll be normally a bumper on the first horn and a bumper yeah. on the first first trumpet just so they can rest a bit and play the important solos but take some of the big tooty stuff off yeah so that's creeping in now in the session world and i've never yeah. seen that before and i think that is because of this 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 whole um you know overdub session thing Absolutely. And like you said, the style of a lot of film music now, the brass is so loud, it's accented, you know, it's just it's it's just hard. It's high or low a lot of the time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, I mean, you know, the, the, the horn writing and we're, we're so lucky because, you know, we have a we can have a, a section of 12 French horns and they're all principal players. Yeah. So they can all scream above the stage. <laughs> yeah. Have them all going up to top C's and top <laughs> D's at Fortissimo. Yeah. And you try that with a, a classical orchestra and you know, the general, the way a horn section split in a classical orchestra is if you have four horns, the first and third are the high guys yeah. and the second and fourth are the mm -hmm. low guys. They've got the interlock. And, thing, you yeah. know, you try and get them all to play up high. It's just, it's clam city. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, so, in film, you get A4 all the way up yeah. or A6. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, A8. It, it really is. And uh, they're extraordinary musicians, but you, you have to be careful not to abuse them. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, really careful about that, and I will. Yeah. I will say to the players, "Do you need, you know, do you need five minutes?" Or, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because their livelihood things that. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, absolutely. You know. And they've, you know, the next day they might be, you know, they'll be playing with an orchestra or something. Yeah. And yeah, if yeah. you completely knacker, <laughs> knacker their lip, it means they, you know, as I, I remember one of the principal horns saying, he had to after one of these sessions he had to take two days off because his lip was so oh bashed about and this is like one of the best in the world so yeah you think yeah, we're not doing something right if that happens absolutely it's like, it's like if you orchestrate something and if one of those players has trouble you d you did something wrong yeah. Yeah. clearly because they can they can play most yeah and you know as an orchestrator you also you, you you see that you know where you write they write incredibly high and incredibly quiet and you think actually that's pretty <laughs> much an Im impossible thing yeah. to do. Okay, you can do it with the sample, but you know, as a player, you know it's it's you can only get it to a certain level. Yeah, and yeah. I say, look, you're not going to get it any quieter. Uh, uh, you can do it on the sample, but let the player play at a comfortable volume, and then you just have to yeah. mix yeah. it down. Yeah. Right. You can do a lot with the samples that don't yeah. don't go that way. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. All right. <laughs> yeah. And actually, talk, sorry, so to jump in, just talking about um, recording in stems, because uh, that's, some, I mean, this question kind of, I think it's, um, it, it will be interesting just for us to know and to maybe, you know, get some ideas to adopt in our own practice as well. Um, what do you get your players to listen to if, say, for example, they're just a brass section um, recording one stem in, in a larger queue? Do you usually get them just you know, listening to the click, or would it be the click along with the mock-ups or things that have like other stems, like maybe strings or winds that might have been recorded before? What what in their ears? Yeah, when um, they're recording the stem. I mean, you don't generally you don't want to give them any mock-ups because the, you know it, the tuning can be a bit variable and um, it, it's just they they always hate that. So give them anything that's been pre-recorded. So if you've done a string section. In the afternoon, give them that. If there's any things that are pre-records but are keepers, like a piano part or a guitar part or something like that, give them that. Um, you know, and often they'll say, actually, just you know, and they don't want too much percussion or anything like that, unless there's a groove thing going on. So they don't want too much information. So just keep it simple, but just something that keeps them tonally centered. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. 
I mean, I, I mean, and players, they'll tell you as well. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not going to be shy and tell, <laughs> telling you what you want. And they're all, they're all so experienced session players that they'll say exactly what they want in their cans. And, yeah. and uh, the brass, whatever it is, yeah. Whatever, yeah. whatever you do, they'll say they want more click. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's so peculiar, isn't it? Like um, from a player's point of view, you know, because we talk about like, the expressiveness the the linearity uh, in music making, while at the same time people are demanding for more click, wanting to be more grounded metronomically as well. And so it's it's such it's such a magical process. Our players are constantly able to strike that balance between thinking up vertically and playing linearly as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, sometimes you will. Um, it's not so easy if you're you're stemming because then you you get. It, synchronization problems but if you've got all the orchestra in the room together sometimes it's nice to do if you've got time to just do a take off click where you can just especially if it's not you're not doing like hit points and things like that if it's a if it's a, an opening title or an end title and you can make the music breathe a bit more then um just go off click um and that that sometimes they're they're the ones that make it to, to the film because they, they feel really organic and the, you know the Rallentandos and the Cellarandos just feel a bit more natural than, than when everybody's holding on to a click and it just breathes a bit more and you know you can see all the players it's almost like their shoulders go down they relax because it's this is what they they started off doing and yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's a nice thing to do if you can and I know I mean John Williams mo virtually all his stuff is off click yeah um, but then you know he only records two or three minutes a session so he's yeah. he's got the luxury to do that um and yeah to and to get it right yeah he gets to do what he wants punches and yeah, you, all yeah, that you, stuff. You don't, you yeah. Don't, you don't mess with jw so. yeah, yeah yeah nobody's gonna tell him to do it to no, quick job yeah, yeah. um all right great you want to move to the kind of general conducting questions yeah let them go for it. yeah um one thing i'm interested in to hear um let's talk about choir conducting for a minute because you've done that too for example on dark knight rises i believe sure yeah yeah i've done quite a lot of choir conducting yeah yeah um so how in your opinion does that differ from doing orchestra i have a strong opinion myself but i'm very interested to hear yeah what i think you got to say yeah i mean you know quite recently I, i've i've actually come to the conclusion that uh, I, I prefer letting somebody else do it <laughs> um so I, I um i always used to conduct choirs and I, I can do it and it is good you know but you i think you have to treat choirs in a very different way to you do an orchestral um th and you know we're very lucky in this country that, that our choirs are amazing readers Incredible. Yeah, yeah. you know you go to you go to la or or uh, anywhere else really that you you've got to kind of teach them the 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 part and you know bash bash notes on on the keyboard whereas i mean we always have a keyboard when you quack and just to give them like the opening chords and stuff yeah. but they're such good readers so um it's really yeah you just i think you have to be a bit gentler um and a little more charming <laughs> <laughs> I, I try a little harder <laughs> i try a little harder with choirs than i do with an orchestra i mean not that i'm rude to an orchestra but it's just just to co <laughs> coax out the thing it's a very different thing you know singing to to, to, to playing an instrument um but do you know uh, over over the last few years you know I, I i work with some great choir directors and i just think they do it better than me you know and i'm honest enough to look in the mirror and go actually what they're doing because they are speaking choir so much more and they've actually normally fixed the choir you know they've put, yeah, together, yeah. put together the voices and curated them actually it's great to to just allow them to do that yeah. and, you know people like ben parry who's who's fantastic at it and he that's what he does all day every day and it's almost an arrogance if i go actually out of the way yeah, you yeah. Know, <laughs> let, let me do it and it's like this is his choir and he he, he gets such good performances out of them I, I, that i've actually generally stepped back um, uh, and allow uh, allow the, the choir, yeah. choir masters to to do it well i mean that that's a being having that humility, I think, is really important in the process in general, because like composers sometimes with conducting their own work, some like to do it and some can do it. But other ones say, you know what, I'd prefer somebody who's more experienced doing this yeah. can get more out of an orchestra. So I think it's. Yeah, I mean, it's, that, it's that's, all, that's that. always a question whether a composer should conduct his music, particularly um, not so much classical music, I think, but uh, yeah. or concert music. But I think film music sometimes 
the compo- the composer's place should be in the booth absolutely with the director and the producers because they can put out fires quickly politically it's yeah. super you know, important yeah. uh, and uh, i just think you know you if you're conducting it it's a you know, it's a very immersive experience and you're you're concentrating on other things and maybe as a and i know some composers love to conduct and that's absolutely fine but it does take longer because you've got to go in and then you have your discussion about the cue after you've recorded it whereas if you're on a tight schedule you can have that discussion while the queue's going down absolutely yeah. yeah yeah so uh, yeah i mean in an ideal world you have as much time as you like and you can play the cue and then play it back with the director and producer talk yeah. about it and then go back out and do it and you know on the big movies absolutely there's the, the budget and the time for that but yeah most of us on most you know generally it feels now that budgets are contracting yeah even the streamers which you know when you started out with streamers because they didn't really know it was it was like oh yeah (laughs) they they were chucking money at at, at stuff and you you get very generous session budgets and now it's tighter and tighter i I think Um, we've even noticed that levin and i working in the industry worked on an apple tv project a year ago and it was the, it, it was very different budget wise how things are now and stuff yeah they know what they're doing now. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> at first they were just ah, give them whatever yeah it's like they it, they were very green and uh, so i mean you know they and it was great and they were very generous and great work was done but now that they they've got people in place and it's much tighter and, yeah and yeah. so you know the budget constraints means that that if if you're if you're not wasting time but if you're spending time every cue is is an extra playback yeah um then that's that's you know that's halving your record time absolutely i mean all of those little things add up tremendously hugely yeah yeah because it, it needs to happen every time do you do you want to because we have uh you know limited time left you want to move on to cy- six cycles and yeah, uh, yeah, cycles seven cycles through 16 actually. as well yeah um <laughs> can i ask an opening question you, this you is go overall it, it. so when writing music that is not to picture and just for an album and things like that, how mm. much do you consider the composition of each individual track and then the overall composition of the album in the flow of that? Because you do have pieces kind of named cycles and then you have different cycles. Do you look at that as more of a macro scale of everything or a micro scale of each track? Um, I mean, the, 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 the album came about, the first one, six cycles, um, I was doing, it, they were kind of, the first couple tracks were like off cuts from ads that I'd done. Oh, oh. And, and they, they hadn't got commissioned. And then the, the ad company that I was working with, he said, um, actually, you know, let's, why don't we just do an album? And he said, and I'll see if I can get them licensed. So it was, it was kind of fairly, um, f- you know, it was fairly commercially minded in a way. Oh, so I did a couple, the, 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 the couple Ooh. were that, and then I wrote some more. And they all had they all had uh, names, um, which initially were, you know, I the, were my working titles. There was one called the, like the first track on the album is called Reflections, which is was basically just like looking out through a window. I think it was a hotel window, and it was raining, and I was f- not feeling very happy, and it was just <laughs> you know. It, and so I kind of sat down and wrote, wrote something. Um, but then the, the kind of label guy said, "Well, let's." let's make them a bit more anonymous. Yeah, um, yeah. So then they became cycle one, two, three, four, five, yeah. six. And it's funny when people say, oh, cycle five, and I, I go, what's that? You know? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I have to look up the, <laughs> the name I called it, you know. Yeah. So, but, um, and then I did another album, which uh, again had, had, um, it had names, but because we'd already done the, 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 the cycle thing, we thought we'd, we'd keep that going. Um, but I always had a sort of programmatic idea in mind and I've actually finished another album now, which is um, kind of loosely based on the idea of pictures and exhibitions. So it was a, oh. it was it was a wander through Tate Britain, mm. and I took eight pictures or it was one sculpture and seven pictures of that influenced me and I, I really loved, and then I wrote pieces about them. Oh, very oh, cool! And yeah. one of them was um, one of them was like one of the pre pre Raphaelites, uh, the the one of Ophelia um, in the stream. And uh, I'd written this this piece, and at the time I was doing the uh, Judy movie with Renee Zellweger. I was, I was the musical director, so I was rehearsing with her a lot. And I found out that the the model for the pre-Raphaelites was uh, a, a lady called Elizabeth Siddle, 
and she she'd been like she was a bit of a muse for the pre-Raphaelites, and she was she was the model for um, Ophelia in this thing. Apparently, she was in like Millet's bathtub for, for, <laughs> for a month. Or so. <laughs> and um, yeah. but um, and uh, but I found out she was also a poet, and she'd written a poem based on this experience. So I got Rene to uh, read the poem over the track, which oh, is kind of cool. Oh, you got Rene's so, That's yeah, very cool. Yeah, very is, cool. is that coming out soon? Yeah, yeah hopefully. Um, yeah, this, it, it kind of it was a casualty of lockdown, but um, you yeah, know, trying to put it together. So that that was that's very pro programmatic and, e and each title is is based on the title of the picture that it's, oh, it's supposed to be so well be sure to give that a listen when yeah, it comes exactly. out yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it sounds very exciting yeah, yeah. <laughs> honestly for me i i think yeah. uh the first piece you were mentioning reflection was kind of the most favorite one for me uh -huh. for me i when i listened to it it kind of gave me more of like a, a feeling of wondering yeah, I don't know if I actually knew what you're trying to. Well, get, also, you know. I mean, I think part of the thing was also, you know, and I, I uh, it's why I kept the cycles names on the second album was to actually let people because I've had people tell me that different emotions that they've felt from the music and rather than me leading them with what I think it's about, it's actually really interesting to hear what other people's reactions are and feelings are and i think i think that's really really nice and that that kind of the anonymity of the name is kind of quite cool in that respect yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, it, it is really cool and mm. for me like uh it's the loss in time and space for me for the whole feeling so maybe oh. everybody has a different um you yeah. know reflection to it yeah we actually have a question from a listener about yes. one of the cycles about sure. uh this is from emma this is a similar thing where it's the feeling she gives it um, this piece, it's cycle six, which yeah. she describes oh, as seven. A, sorry, seven. Seven is it says cycle six in this one. Is the question about seven? Yeah, it's about seven. Oh, okay, my mistake then. A winter, um, a wintry, intense mood in Berlin. That's how how she describes it. What is that's what the image it kind of gives her. What inspired you to write that piece? I wonder if that's accurate or if that's maybe she lives in Berlin. So actually, that's, that's what she's not, getting. That's not far off because I, I think I actually was in Berlin. Oh, very it. amazing. Because I, I actually do quite, <laughs> I do quite a lot of work in Berlin. Then I work a lot with the, the Babelsberg Film Orchestra. Oh, yeah. which is that's in, who you in, recorded the album? Yes, they, yeah. they, 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 they recorded the album, yeah. And they're, they're based uh, just outside Berlin um, in the Babelsberg Film film Park, which is near Potsdam. Yeah. Potsdam. But uh, um, they're a great little orchestra and I, I've toured with them quite a lot. We, um, we toured India and we went to Indonesia to oh, to, amazing. to to do Metropolis live, which was good fun. Oh, yeah. that's a very wow. that's very yeah. cool. That's a that's a workout. Have you ever conducted that one? No, I've I've been to a live concert of that. Yeah, uh, I've I, seen I admired the, the well. conductor from well, the distance. That's, it's, it's very that's two <laughs> very hour, difficult that's to two do. Two and a half hours of hard graft. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I had a friend. <laughs> I had a friend who improvised. Uh, a score on the organ to Metropolis. Wow, so that was kind of cool as well. That's, that is very <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been been over to yeah. uh, Berlin as well. You know, the the, ba the uh, Babylon Cinema. Mm -hmm. in berlin mm -hmm. I, I go there and conduct sometimes as well because they do regular screenings in metropolis so oh, that's, cool. it's one of my party oh. tricks and yeah. <laughs> no no click track you just um you just learn the score and yeah, uh, mental. yeah. but it's, it's a great score as well as Gottfried two pits yeah 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 but very uh, very cool i love berlin one of my best friends from college who i went to uh ucla with actually so he's originally french but he moved to berlin so now that i'm over here i visit him all the time oh, cool. it's yeah. wonderful city yeah it's a great city I yeah need to go there wonderful there. orchestras too as well brilliant yeah i mean there's so there's so much i mean besides the um you know obviously the berlin phil you know there's so many great great um orchestras mm. and, and opera companies and yeah yeah and recording you know as well i mean besides the babelsberg orchestra yeah, there's a great studio called teldeck yeah um, yeah and they 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 get um, orchestras mainly, I think, from the um, the Deutsche Opera. And the yeah, fantastic. I think that's where they do the samples for orchestral. They tools, do. I think orchestral like, tools. They're running uh, it, right? They absolutely they're do. Somehow yeah. connected. I'm personally very pro orchestral tools oh. because I've written demos for them. So yeah. <laughs> buy, buy their libraries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, uh, it's a gr great studio and it's a really nice setup as well. Yeah, so. yeah. Great. Yeah, wonderful. Um, other question about cycles? Oh, actually, Darren, do you want to go for the next one? I mean, actually, the, the next one, to me, is kind of, it's, it's more of a sort of personal thing. I reconnect it with uh, cycle number six, um, which is really dense, really dark, um, and yet quite intimate as well. Um, would you say that, um, on the whole, because, I mean, Matt, we 
a lot of us know you as an orchestrator or an arranger or a conductor of other people's music. Would you say that Cycles um, is a good reflection of who you are as a creative? Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, I think it is actually. I mean, it's funny. I, I <laughs> you know, I started off um, doing pop arranging and then I got into um, film arranging. And then I, I had a period kind of early 2000s where I was doing quite a lot of composing. I did quite a lot of film, um, quite a lot of TV stuff, and I did a few films. Um, but then it started becoming a bit of a problem in just that I was wearing too many hats. Um, right. And, you know, there was one instance mm -hmm. where I was pitching for a film that a client of mine who I was arranging for was oh. also pitching for. <laughs> and I suddenly Ooh. thought, I've got, to make a, I've got to make a decision here, you know, and... Uh, and to be honest, I, I I didn't want to give up the arranging and the conducting because I I do love it and it, it's part of what I do and who I am, and so I, I kind of made a decision yeah. to 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 step back a little bit from the composing because I think I'd I'd just have had to just have had to do that, and I I didn't you know I like mm. the fact I've got this slightly strange career you know and I've got a great agent who who appreciates that it's a bit. It's a bit wonky, you know, and there's there's a bit of arranging, there's a bit of conducting, there's a bit of composing, there's, you know, all sorts of things that I like to do. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I kind of stepped back and then, but then I wanted to write, but I, the, the way, the way I kind of found that was by doing these albums, which then actually have been fairly successful in terms, commercially, just in terms that they've been licensed for films and trailers and adverts and things like that so but it's a way i can just express myself musically without um you know ruining the day job yeah yeah, yeah. well so. I, I think it's very hard <laughs> to do that because i feel like anyone who does music there are ideas that you kind of feel like you need to get out at a certain point so yeah no I, matter what you do yeah i like to write you know most days and i, I i've got a whole load of stuff that i've written that's I don't know what I'll do with, but I just I just like to to write, and I think I I don't think that in any way uh, hurts my orchestration and arranging chops because yeah. I think it keeps those creative creative juices flowing. And yeah. Agreed, know, yeah. any anybody who's done any yeah. orchestration or arranging knows it's a, it is a very creative process. Of course, yeah. And obviously, you know, some composers allow mm -hmm. you to do more, and some some are more prescriptive and and you do less. But it's still you are making creative decisions. And uh, I think, you know, to be able to, to, to write, you know, compose your own music, I think is quite important in that. Yeah. And I, I you know, when I first started writing, I, I remember I, I thought, oh, actually, because I'd always, it always been this thing that, oh, I'm not a composer, I'm an arranger. And then when I started doing it, I thought, actually, there's very little difference. Yeah, know? yeah. It's just that maybe my chord sequences are better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, <laughs> you know, especially on a, if you're, do, you know, when I, uh, arranging a pop song, there's there's a lot of original material that yeah. you're yeah. bringing to the party. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's a big leap. And I also think that the two uh, are kind of mutually sympathetic. Yeah. But it just career-wise and industry-wise it, it, it seemed to m make sense to me to have that kind of demarcation so yeah. so people you know didn't get confused because yeah. you know the industry loves to put you in a box anyway of course yeah yeah, yeah. well i think that's yeah a place to yeah. Uh, stop off on well, time one last oh okay go yeah. ahead yeah. I think, I think we have time. oh i've got i've got another last one as well okay so many okay. as you, wow. really? you want guys <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll go so how about you go and, and then i'll go with my last one honestly it's just a short one i'm just curious about your compositional process because mm. there are people who um plan their composition and there are people who uh, improv or like just play around the piano and stuff for me I like to play on the piano and kind of like see what where it goes so what what would be your yeah um, I, I'm, I'm like you I like to improv I think uh, planning <laughs> it kills it um, the only thing I, I noticed quite early on with my composition is I, I have to be quite strict with myself because being a you know a decent arranger I can make anything sound okay and you know sometimes sometimes <laughs> we we have to you know work with material from a composer that's not great that you mm. have to yeah. make sound better than it is and i think you know i i was falling into that trap where i'd do a little motif and it wouldn't be great but i'd make it sound really good because i do this big arrangement on it and then actually listening to it thinking actually the core is is 
is rotten you know <laughs> even though even though the outside you know it's like it's like when you you know you cut into an apple and it looks lovely yeah, and, yeah. and then you you cut it open and there's a wasp in the middle or something. Yeah. Oh. and so i i i have to i have to be quite strict with myself is like don't start arranging too early yeah yeah actually write and write mm. something that's really has got something and mm -hmm. then only then start you know allowing your arranging chops to one of the in. best pieces of advice i ever got from a composition teacher was exactly that figure out the core of it yeah. and then add the filigree and other things yeah. they said it's like if you're building a house you don't pick out the lamp first you build the foundation first exactly. yeah that's Absol true absolutely yeah. true yeah. yeah yeah so that i yeah i had to that was a lesson well learned but uh, yeah yeah so that but my, yeah my process it's very organic you know I, I i can't sit down and work out a structure and a chord sequence and things like that i it doesn't i tend to follow follow a melody line and then then harmonize that melody line yeah and i've yeah. worked a lot in um, indian music you know i work a lot with the uh, composer ar raman and he's uh, indian music is very mm. sort of non-chordal in a lot yeah. of ways you know you often have this drone and then you have these amazing melodies over the top yeah which ar ar does and that's i think that's really interesting sometimes you don't need to harmonize yeah, yeah. sometimes you can just have like a c yeah. a c drone with with something really interesting on top so yeah exactly yeah yeah absolutely darren yep. did I ask yeah. the last question darren, go for it yeah <laughs> right so this is the uh the, the passing question i believe um something a little bit broader considering how matt you've already done uh, a huge body of work uh in in various genres and with various collaborators but is there anything any any aspect of music or process or genre that you're still interested to explore and that perhaps you've not done before um i'd like to do i mean i just as a, as a writer i'd like to do more with dance I've done I've done a few show oh. I've done a few Ooh. shows and worked with a choreographer and really enjoyed it and actually one of my cycles pieces um, we did a little thing with um, uh, Charlotte Evans at the uh, uh, Royal Opera House uh, the Royal Ballet mm. she's one of their choreographers mm. and we did and she she set one of those to to um, one of my cycles pieces with with she did this beautiful ballet thing uh, so I'd like to do something more with dance because I really. I find there's something magical about that. Oh yeah, I'd love yeah. to do a sort of performance piece with a yeah, with a choreographer. And when, and when I've worked with a choreographer on on the couple of shows I've done, I've really enjoyed it, and that's that's informed what I've written. As well. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I did um, something yeah. for a ballet, and I just loved it. I thought it was so much fun. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to do that. But uh, other than that, you know, I just yeah, there's, some, I just there's something it. magically <laughs> abstract about it as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and it, yeah, I, I really so love, you, yeah. love the idea of doing something really sort of beautiful and artistic with an amazing choreography and amazing lighting and just the real, you know, something you could do at a festival. So that that would be my dream. Yeah, wonderful. Amazing. Well, great talking to you, Matt. We really yeah. appreciate yes. you. Yeah, being yeah here thank you so much. much. Yes. That's great. It was pleasure. wonderful talking. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> okay. Safe travel home. <laughs>